Type one, type two panoramas. I think we got everybody here. Now there'll be a bit of feedback for a second. I'm going to disable the microphone to my meeting, turn down the volume to zero on that second instance, and go. So the sound's good, so I'll turn off my level indicators. In the chat, if you guys can uh, let me know if everybody can hear me, just uh, if everybody can hear me once and exactly once with no echoes, just nice and clear. Just type in the chat if you can hear me clearly. Good. So we are doing type three panel. Uh, that was just kind of a fun little topic to sort of get going on the, on the, um, on, in the world of reality. And uh, so I've got the Instructable up now. And the Instructable doesn't really have anything new in it that isn't already in the website. So it's more just, you know, as a place to, a repository to put the, I made it. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the people at Instructables.com featured my Instructable because they really liked it. So that's kind of a good thing. <laughs> it shows that maybe I'm not too bad of a professor in terms of, of uh, teaching. Uh, so this is under teachers uh, category of, uh, of Instructables. So in Instructables, there's something called Teachers University. And uh, uh, so if you look under Teachers, are the, you know, my Instructables featured under Teachers right next to Pi, calculating Pi using Python. So there's lots of really good educational examples. Take a look at some of the other ones too, if you like this kind of thing. Um, so um, there, there is uh, calculating pi, collapsible origami, pinhole camera. So there's lots of actually very relevant instructables. Marble Vader wave is kind of cool too, because you can understand how sine waves are made. So there's lots of really good educational content there. So take a look at some of the uh, instructables that other people have come up with as well. Um, and uh, I think I think it's it's good to just see some examples. Draw a PI bracket E with triangles like Archimedes. That's super awesome. And so there's a lot of really fun things that you'll be able to learn from in here. Uh, 3D printable things. And for those of you who have 3D printers, anything like that. Super cool, fun, awesome material. So type three panorama, uh, I think everybody understands. I, 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 got a, I got the sense that lots of you understand what's going on. And um, from the presentations yesterday, what's happening, I think we're, we're all on the same page. You know, so this example here on the left, there's a type one and on the right, there's a type two. And there's a smooth transition from type one to type two. Some people were a little bit confused, but if you look on the left, that scene has depth. It has multiple depth planes. It's quite three-dimensional. And so I'm turning around, but the three-dimensionality is totally irrelevant because from a fixed point where you're not moving your vantage point, the three-dimensionality does not matter. It's all as if it was just flat because there's no depth to this subject matter unless you move. And so the idea is to not have depth. Uh, so on the left, it doesn't have depth because I'm not moving. And on the right, it doesn't have depth because the subject matter is planar. Well, approximately, but again, the devil's in the details. And the fun thing is it's kind of fun and playful because the streetcar is planar. Behind it, there's a, the buildings that are planar. And then in the foreground, there's the street. And they're all different to some degree. So something has to give. 
but it's kind of fun because you can see the bicycle and the streetcar quite faithfully reproduce. The streetcar is a very bold, strong um, element there. And we can get relative motion in the streetcar. We can play with that as well, too, because you can get panorama due to you moving or panorama due to the subject matter moving. It's just that the plane has to move relative. There has to be relative motion or relative movement between the planar subject matter and the camera. And so you can wait for a streetcar to move and hold your camera still, or you can have a, a stationary plane and move your camera or a little of both. In this case, there's kind of a little of both. The streetcar is moving and I'm moving. So there's relative motion. And if you're clever with it, you can get the relative motion between say a streetcar and your camera to also cooperate the existence of another planar patch. So that planar patch in the background is is there uh, due to movement of only the camera. And in the foreground, there's the streetcar moving and the camera moving. So there's different rates of movement. And if you play around a little bit, you can have some fun with those rates of movement and corroborate multiple subject matter, such as a streetcar and something behind it by just judicial choice of your speed of movement and the streetcar speed of movement and how you go. So you can choose to go left to right or right to left with a westbound streetcar, for example, you can decide to move the camera uh, from west to east or east to west. You can move retrograde or prograde with the streetcar. And that choice of retrograde or prograde motion will then have a bearing on how the other plane of patch behind it, namely the building, is rendered. So so that's, a, that's your type 3 panorama. And I just put here when you're doing an instructable, by the way, and I encourage you guys all to learn instructables, it's a good way to teach and share your work. Uh, when you're doing an instructable, one thing I find is that if you've got panoramic images, usually you only want one picture on each step, because if you put multiple pictures in each step, it'll tile them, it'll array them. And it's the same as a Facebook post and that kind of thing. So if you're doing social media with a panorama, uh, it's often better to just only post one image because otherwise it'll tile the images and panoramas don't look so good when they're tessellated because it boxes them out and takes the central region. Um, panoramas look nice when they're just shown full from left to right. Uh, if you post these to Facebook, by the way, they'll show up as VR if they're shot that way. And so you can actually put on a VR headset and go to our Facebook page like swim up, um, facebook.com slash group slash swim OP and you can actually put on an Oculus or other headset and look around and sort of imagine, imagine that you're there. You can almost pretend that you're at the swim up. Of course, you won't feel the splash of the water in your face. Virtual reality will never take us for a swim. You can go sightseeing uh, with VR, but you can't get the taste of the food or the, the feel of the water on your face and actually the joy and pleasure of going for a swim. I think we're a long way before VR will give us that. So, and then with the type two, I just put each step in this uh, instructable. I just, every single step, I broke it down into steps. I left out a lot of the detail because it's just for a general audience and I put the references at the end. So for instructables, you wanna keep them very, very simple. So there's type two. The first step is to become familiar with constructing type one panoramas. Step two is learn how to do type two panoramas. Step three is doing type three panoramas and then Step four is doing type four panoramas. And this loosely speaking, I call that a, a one, two, one uh, panorama because it's the left part of it's one type one, the middle part is type two and the right part of it is type one again. So I call that like I, 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 or uh, type four if you want, but I guess you could say it's still type three. And then uh, step five, I said, okay, become a master of prograde and retrograde motion, try to understand what those concepts mean. And step six, just be creative. Step seven, learn something. So I put all the references and details at the end here uh, with a list of references. And I put a link to the website, uh, which we have for the class, which is here, which you've already read and understood. It has a little bit more detail in it. So here's where there's, there's more details, which I've left out of the instructable. So uh, the instructor at least gives you a place, a repository, a place where you can post that work, uh, post your results. All you have to do is down here where it says 
I made it right there where it says I made it. Just click on I made it and and uh, and post something and we've already got one example. This is a really nice example, by the way. I love this example of the book, the book stacks because it's just so bold and, and, and crisp and compelling. And, uh, you know, that it's interesting how this showed up as, as you scroll through it a little bit to see that image. So that's quite nice. And then there's, this is what we would call probably that last one there is probably what we call a type four panorama. If we, I mean, it's still type three, I guess, or we call it a type four because it goes one, two, one. So anyway, this is good because there's a, this is a good example of a submission because there's a PDF here. I open the PDF and uh, it's well laid out. It's well presented. Uh, good mathematical analysis. Like it, it clearly shows an understanding of the subject matter. And I like these examples. Whenever you do something fun like that, it tells me you really understand what's going on. So look down at your feet. So this is, is kind of nice because you've got your feet in the picture and you go up and you've got your head in the picture. And so this is uh, plus the self in the mirror. So this is this is brilliant. This shows me as a piece of art, as a work of art, this shows me that the student has a deep understanding of what was taught in the course because not only the technical understanding, but also artistically and aesthetically and conceptually a deep understanding to be able to produce art. That's like what jazz music is, you know. Jazz shows that you have an understanding of music because you listen to something and respond to it. So this is a good example because it's a listening, uh, understanding what was taught and responding to it, not just simply putting the same thing out again as you might on an exam. You know, if you study for exams, then, you know, you just re replay the same thing that you learned in the class. And that's not necessarily the same depth of intelligence as if you can actually riff on something and mix it up, mix and ma mash, mash it up and come up with something new. So that's what we really like to see in this class. So post your results, and I'm really looking forward to seeing them. Um, I can give you a bit more time, you know, because uh, we were we had some issues with the server, our ITEP server was down and so on. So um, I'll, I'll be a little bit lenient, say just get them in by, uh, um, you know, by the end of the week, preferably. And if you need more time, just email me and let me know uh, that you need more time and I can uh, accommodate. So now let me go to I'm sharing off. And so the next session or the next take here, I want to do the last lab of this course, lab five, on something that's very close to my heart, which is radar and active vision. And this all uh, comes from Simon Haken's concept of radar vision and AI and machine learning built into radar. This is work. Uh, now, we've been studying machine learning and research for many years. You know, uh, Bernie Widrow at Stanford University built a, a hearing aid that has, has machine learning built into it. And all kinds of early work like that, Simon Haken was one of the first to jump into this field of machine learning. Marvin Minsky founded the whole field of AI and machine learning at MIT and simultaneously Stanford University had a, a large thrust in AI as well. And Marvin Minsky and Ray Kurzweil, the chief engineer of Google and myself, the three of us wrote a paper in 1993 called, you know, the, the, about uh, AI and machine learning. And we called it the sensularity, the sensory singularity. People say the singularity is near. We're almost going to divide by zero and blow ourselves up. But uh, would I say the sensularity or sensory singularity is, is, is upon us? It's not just near, we're right in the throes of it. So uh, if you get a chance to read that paper, that will give you some background. Also, if you get a chance, so it's, it's uh, Marvin Minsky, Ray Kurzweil, and Steve Mann, 1993, uh, or not 1993, 20, 2013. 2013, there was an earlier 1998 paper, but I think if you start with the, the 2013 paper by, by Minsky, Kurzweil, and Mann, uh, that will give you a good 
understanding of the sensuality. And then if you go back to some of the other work, like Simon Haken's work on radar vision and growlers. So we built the first radar that can detect growlers, iceberg fragments, which are too small to show up in other radar systems, but do quite a bit of damage to ships and vessels. And, and so that was uh, very, very important work because uh, we, we built, we used the chirplet transform. We noticed that ice floating around bobs up and down. And the way that waves go is they're cyclic. They're sort of periodic. They're kind of sinusoidal, not exactly, but they have a Fourier series. And the, the, the period changes a little bit. So they chirp up and down, but by and large, they, they bob up and down. And if something bobs up and down at a steady speed, if you throw a cork or a, a bottle with a lid on it into the lake, you'll notice that it, it doesn't just bob straight up and down, it kind of goes around in a circle. So you could think of it uh, as, as circular motion. It doesn't just go straight up and down. And since it goes around in a circle, when you look at the top of it, you see this uh, sinusoidal oscillation. If you look at the front of it, you see kind of a sinusoidal oscillation, 90 degrees out of phase roughly. So you've got a complex valued uh, function if you look at the top and the front. And so your radar uh, pointing straight at it <laughs> is going to see this sinusoidal movement where the iceberg fragment moves towards and away from the radar periodically or cyclically. And what I did is created a machine learning system with machine learning built right into the transform. It's called the Chirplet transform. And it has a machine learning built into the transform space. And, and so what you do is you see the Doppler return from these iceberg fragments. And so uh, today, actually, I'm going to be taking my uh, radar out and recording some more Doppler uh, from their last remaining ice fragments in the lake because it's getting warmer now and they're all disappearing. So I'm going to get out on some ice and paddle and uh, uh, have some fun and, and also measure some Doppler returns. So if you look at that early work, radar vision, and you look at the Chirplet transform, you'll see some of that work on Doppler returns from ice fragments. And that's what gives it, that takes us to a topic that we call water human computer interaction, water HCI. For the last 24 years, this will be the 24th annual water HCI conference on March 30th. And you're all welcome to join us. And maybe some of you want to write something and publish it in that conference. Feel free to join us in writing. And writing a little bit about water HCI. <laughs> now I'm just going to walk over to the chalkboard here and dial me down a little bit here in terms of shutter speed. Let's darken up just a little bit and then focus it. And then I'm going to go to small enough aperture like f11 so there's a little bit of depth of field now if i'm over here i think you can still hear me so last night i made a paddle just for fun and so this paddle here is i've got a piece of wood here on another piece of wood, wooden paddle and then we attach a sequential wave and printing machine to the paddle which is a sequence of lights that light up in terms of voltage response. And there's a gravity field, it's basically an oscilloscope attached to this thing. And we have various sensors on the paddle. And so what I've done in some sense is like the tradition of paddling. So if you think historically, the world's first cyborgs were people on vessels. Vessels were the world's first cyborg technology. And Let me just go here, just insert that so you can see that from overhead. Vessels were the first, uh, the earliest form of cyborg technology, human enhancement. Manfred Klein coined the term cyborg, and the example that he used is a person riding a bicycle. This one is a cyborg. That word cyborg means cybernetic organism. Cybernetics comes from the Greek word to steer, which comes from vessels or boats. 
So the word cyborg originates from boating, from vessels, from steering, from helmsman who operates a ship or vessel. And so it's very closely connected. And in fact, Manfred Klein said his favorite example of cyborg is a person riding a bicycle. But I said, if a, if a bicycle is, if someone riding a bicycle is a cyborg, then someone on a vessel or boat is also a cyborg because it also functions as a true extension of the human mind and body. So in this sense, cyborgs as a concept are more than a million years old, older than the invention of clothing, older than the invention of the wheel, older than the even homo sapiens. So today, if there's a suitable fragment of ice, I was thinking of maybe getting on that ice and I've got somebody who can support me in another vessel for safety. And I was thinking of paddling to Toronto Island with this paddle that I made. So I made a paddle, jumped on a piece of ice, and then able to paddle somewhere. I'll take some journey. If it's not safe to go all the way to the island, I might take a shorter trip somewhere. But I'll go somewhere on the ice, much as people might have done more than a million years ago. There's evidence historically that human civilizations uh, built or fashioned vessels and were able to travel long distances across continents from one continent to another uh, across oceans using these things that they built. So I built this 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 vessel, this uh, this paddle here, and the way, if you just from an engineering point of view, it's kind of fun to, to look at the construction. So it's a flat piece here, and I've got these, this ribbing here to give it a little bit of reinforcement. And I've got this cut at an angle. It's a stand-up paddleboard, SUP, is very much in line with the ancient civilization. The idea of standing on a raft or standing on logs, tying a bunch of logs together and standing on that, or standing on a piece of ice and just paddling. This, this is a, a slight angle. And so you can see I've cut that and tapered it. And then my next step is to find a fallen tree in the forest and carve a paddle from a fallen tree. Now these clamps. To hold everything together while the glue is setting. I'll just set these aside to free up my chalkboard. So that was a fun little exercise last night. Really had that was fun building that. And today I'll see how seaworthy or lakeworthy it is. Colored circle and technology I've got represented by a green rectangle, like a computer screen or oscilloscope screen. And so the early example was detecting ice fragments. That was one early example of water HCI. So if you have waves like this, they exhibit simple harmonic motion. A particle that's sitting here tends to go around in a circle. And so the Doppler radar return from that particle when radar waves are, are reflected off that piece of ice, they're going to bounce back. And the waves, when they come back, are going to undergo some kind of a Doppler shift. And the shift will be in proportion to the velocity of that movement. So if we look at a graph of time and, and, and velocity, as this is time, and this is velocity, and time uh, and and uh, and velocity. So you're going to see that uh, it, it'll it'll it might even go negative. The velocity might go negative. You know, it'll go like up and down, and at times the velocity goes negative, which means it's simply going in the other direction. And so, if we look at the Doppler return, Doppler is proportional to velocity. 
So we simply change that to frequency, time and frequency. Because the time and the frequency in the Doppler return is basically going up and down and up and down. Uh, it's going, the frequency is going higher and lower and higher and lower as, as time and frequency has it. Uh, going and so what we will see here is if we plot that as a function of time, if we plot this simply as a function of time and voltage, this is time and this is the voltage here, what we'll see is that we've got it's going from high frequencies to low frequencies and back again. So if something was starting out at low frequencies, it's going to go like this, and then it's going to go to higher and higher and higher frequencies, and then lower, and then higher, and then lower. So you can see what I've drawn here is I've drawn this waveform that goes at low frequencies, you know. So it goes up and down in pitch. And so that's like frequency modulation. So the message signal, so this is kind of a meta sine wave. It's a sine wave of a sine wave. So the sine wave, uh, let's say, is, os is modifying the pitch of another sine wave. And so this is like a warbling sound. And there's birds that make that sound, they're called warblers. And so we call this, this is a variation of the triplet transform that picks up this and we call that the warblet transform which is a special case of the triplet transform, the warblet transform. Lots of people have built on this work now too. The warblet transform is a special case of the triplet transform that looks at warbling signals and tries to understand how these warbling signals work. You know, it's like, You know, like the sound that a police siren might make as an example of that, up and down in pitch, which is exactly what we did with this marine radar system that picks up time frequency signatures that are sick, like our sinusoid. So in general, we're going to have time frequency distributions. And we're probably familiar with lots of time and frequency distributions in everyday life. You know, the time and frequency, you know, so if you have, we often draw them like this in ordinary everyday life in children's books. We write time frequency distributions like this sometimes. And it might be like, you know, there's a blob of energy here and then here and then here, and then there's so that's like so that's twinkle twinkle little star as a TFD, that's called a TFD time frequency distribution Time goes, usually time goes from left to right. The frequency goes from top to bottom. This is approximately log, the logarithm of frequency, roughly speaking, uh, along a certain scale. And so that, that gives you an idea of the distribution of how much energy is present at any given point in time and any given point in frequency. And of course, Heisenberg in 1926 says that you can't know exactly uh, these are called canonical conjugate variables in quantum mechanics, like position and momentum or time and frequency. There's that famous joke that, that, that said, you know, that the policeman pulls Heisenberg over and says, uh, do you know how fast you were going? And he says, well, I know where I am right now, so I couldn't possibly know how fast I was going. And again, similarly, if you know what frequency something is, you can't know when it occurred. And if you know when it occurred, you can't know what frequency it was. And that's true if you take a waveform, uh, like some waveform like this, the sine wave, say, and you take a little short piece of it that's infinitesimally short, it's just a click or a pop, and you won't know what frequency at all it is. It's just one sample. 
and you can't know how many vibrations per second it is. So you need a longer piece. And if you know exactly what the frequency of something is, it must have gone from minus infinity to infinity. We made a little musical performance called 440, which was we, we had a tuning fork that was controlled by a servo mechanism to keep it vibrating all the time. And we put it in a soundproof box and we rolled it and we had it sitting in the music hall. So everybody came into the music hall, sat down to listen to the performance. And then we opened up the box for four minutes and 40 seconds and let everybody hear it. And then we closed the box. And so the, pre the, the premise is that the only flaw in that performance is the fact that it only has finite duration. And if it was for infinite duration, it would be a 440 cycles per second tone of absolute certainty. But because we only listen to it for a finite time, it can't possibly be perfectly known in pitch. So that's where you're going to see things like the Fourier transform, which we all know about. Which is, you know, time, frequency, and then the wavelet transform. Which you can certainly read lots about. The Haar transform, I guess, is the earliest version of it, invented in 1911. So I'll say that's relatively modern. 1911 was when it came into being in its first earliest form, I guess. And uh, in this case, you've got time and scale. So instead of time and frequency, we've got time and scale. And scale is, roughly speaking, logarithm of frequency. So you've got time and the logarithm of frequency is the axis. And so in the Fourier sense, you've got, you know, this, this, and we can, we can, the Fourier transform really doesn't tell you when things occur, but the way it's typically applied, so the Fourier transform normally goes from minus infinity to infinity, but we have called what's called the short time Fourier transform which is where we chop the signal up, whatever we're trying to measure. We chop it up into little bits and do the Fourier transform of each piece and then stack them all up so we can see how it sometimes. So we take the Fourier transform, put it here, take the next piece and put it here, and the next piece and put it here, and then we get a two-dimensional array that shows us approximately what frequencies occur and in, in what locations and where, what and where they occur. And so that gives us this, uh, spectrogram or something of that sort. And uh, more likely though, we want from everyday life, you know, in terms of listening to music and sound, we hear the human ear operates on a logarithmic scale. So we often want the logarithm. So the wavelet transform makes more sense. You know, even a piano, if you play the lower notes on the piano, they hang around a lot longer and the high notes die out really quickly. So there's certainly more of a notion of scale than pitch. So, and we talk about octaves rather than, than cycles per second change. So an octave is a doubling, twice as much pitch each one. So then that's exactly what the wavelet gives you. It gives you, you move up the scale, you know, you go from one octave, each equal tick mark along the scale is the next octave higher in pitch. So that's log frequency. And so this, this distribution of the wavelets your tiles, the time frequency plane logarithmically. And if I were to put that, you know, more on the traditional plane, it would be more like this. The lower notes of a piano last longer, so you let's draw the bigger, and then the next higher notes are shorter, like this. And then the next higher notes are even shorter in duration, like this. So you've got the wavelet tiling. This is wavelet as viewed as compared how to compare the wave you to the Fourier in, in, in this way. And so these are tilings of the time frequency plane. And what I said, I guess my discovery was to say how we can tile the time frequency plane in a way that's not necessarily lined up to the axis, but we could think of tiling the time frequency plane uh, sort of like, like tilings of the plane that are not necessarily lined up with the axis anymore. And so we can have shear in, so this is called a chirp, a time varying frequency shift is called a chirp. So a chirp, 
So a chirp is just like a sound of a chirp. It's like up chirps and down chirps, time varying frequency shift, and we can modulate something. We can change the the, the, the time varying frequency shift is is a chirp, and dispersion is a frequency varying time shift. So analogously, we also have the concept of dispersion. So we might have something like this, where we've got tilings that look like this as a time frequency. And so when we have this kind of thing going on, there's shear this way, and that's dispersion. So dispersion, dispersive media, are media that 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 there's a time varying, uh, you know, a, over over time the over frequency as you change in frequency there's a time shift. So both of these manifest themselves as degrees of freedom in the time frequency plane. So we have time shift. We have a time axis. How much left and right go? We have a frequency shift. We have a time shear and a frequency shear, which are chirp and dispersion, and then. We also can talk about the scale of what this, so you got time, frequency, scale, chirp, and dispersion. So these are degrees of freedom that act on the time frequency plane that gives us the, the elements of the chirp of transform. And so that's kind of where my discovery was in terms of marine radar, how to see these iceberg fragments using this new technique, which also has a lot of other techniques. Uh, we, used this originally for marine radar, but it's being used for biosignals. Uh, someone here at the University of Toronto wrote a whole thesis on using the triplet transform for brain uh, computer interfaces, PCI, and visual evoke potentials. So there's a lot of work there on, on uh, and heart sounds, uh, heart rate variability, HRV is just chirpiness. So that's another example of chirpiness is HRV, heart rate variability. And a chirpy heart is a healthy heart. So if you have COVID, your heart may be less chirpy. So if you want to make a COVID detector based on HRV, you could try to estimate you know, the likelihood of COVID based on the non-chirpiness of the heart. So when your heart responds to its surroundings and chirps up and down, you go for an ice water swim, you can get your heart down to into the 30s if you just carefully calm yourself in, in zero degree water, then uh, uh, and you can, you know, your heart can go up and down in, in, in response to various things. And that's a good thing. Whereas if your heart's not responding, you know, there's less HRV. So we can use this as a measure of health. Chirpy heart equals healthy heart. And the triplet transform, of course, factors into that. And companies like Andromed were, were making uh, hardware implementations of the triplet transform, designing chips that compute triplet transform in real time. And so that's... The chirp of transform is is something we can talk about. We can talk about radar. You know, we can talk about marine radar or radar in general as a form of interaction. You know, we have we have a piece of uh, piece of ice here floating around, and uh, for fun, you know, maybe I'm standing up here with my paddle, uh, paddling away in the water here, and then we've got over here a radar set that's picking up and transmitting actively, sending out a wave, sending out waves to that ice, and then receiving reflected waves coming back and looking at the top of the trend from it. So that's one way to do it. Another thing that, that I sometimes do just for fun is I put the radar set right on the ice. So I'm standing up here on a block of ice, a piece of ice with my paddle. And I've got here a radar set right on the ice. I've mounted a radar set right on this piece of ice here. And I've got it in a waterproof enclosure so if it falls into the water, it doesn't damage the radar, it just floats around. And, uh, and then it sends out <laughs> radar signals, and then it picks up whatever comes back against the whole universe. So it's it's pointing out radar, and we, we often talk about sea clutter, or in this case, lake clutter, which is just the return from massive water or anything else like that. 
these waves go out into free space and come back. Maybe they bounce off other other objects, distant buildings, land masses, anything. And the ice itself is moving, and this is the ego motion, as we call it, self motion. You know where the camera moves. So when you're doing a vision, you can talk about these two kinds of motion. When you did your type two panoramas, you can let the streetcar move by and, and scan itself, or you can move yourself and scan something. So there's the relative motion between the sensor and the environment. And we talk about ego motion as the motion, as self motion, motion of the self, and ego means self. And so if this ice is moving, it, we have ego motion. So the, 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 the sensor, the camera or radar, or lidar or sonar or whatever it is, is fixtured to your own set of coordinates and you're moving and measuring the whole world. And so we do a lot of things like that. You know, in, in, in radar, you've got synthetic aperture radar where your radar set is moving and you've got a synthetic aperture from the movement of the radar. And then you've got ISAR, which is inverse synthetic aperture radar, which is where you wait for objects to move like ships are moving and you just image the ship and let us movement create a synthetic aperture. So these relative movements are really important and I'm hoping that you learn something from uh, lab four about relative movement and I'm hoping to see that some of you got the creative juices flowing and doing these panoramas type two and doing some of them at least where you've got some subject matter that's moving and you hold the camera still so that you can understand how you can get that relative movement and how you can how you can make use of it. Uh, another thing to, to think about is that is there's the radar equation. You've got this this radar it's 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 putting out a signal and then you've got your your ice here. Maybe here with the paddle or whatever it is. This is your, this is your subject matter, and the radar. The signal falls off as the inverse square of the distance. So is the inverse square law because if you look at a patch or an object, if you came twice as close, let's say we're here. Let's say there's another. I'll just draw a different color. Let's say in green here we've got another paddle board or standing on another piece of ice. Uh, the same size piece of ice and the same size person, but they're twice as close uh, as the other one. So the area they sort of tell you, if you look at the area, like in this dimension, that, another color like this. So the area they subtend, this is the area that they subtend. So you can think like this. So in this dimension, in the, in the vertical dimension, the one that's twice as far away has, to, has half the height that it subtends in the, in the angle to half the area. But in the other dimension, in the horizontal dimension, it's also half. So the area, the radar cross section, it's called. That sound we hear in the background, that siren, can you guys hear that? So that, exactly, that's a, that's a warbler that's going like this. So that's a warble. Uh, so anyway, there's slight distraction there, right? So the radar cross section is the area it subtends, and that gets uh, as you move twice as far away, it's a it's a quarter of the strength, and if you move three times as far away, it's a ninth the strength, and so on. So there's an inverse square law with how strong that radar wave hits the target. And then the radar wave bounces off the target and comes back. So here, the radar wave is bouncing back this way, and it's doing the same thing again. It has to go this distance, but this one here has to go twice as far when it bounces off this target. This one has to go twice as far. So it's twice as far there and twice as far back. So when it's coming back, it's also a quarter of the strength. So the received strength varies as one over R to the fourth. So it's one over R squared getting there times one over R squared coming back. And so the signal strength is one over R to the fourth, one over the radius to the fourth. So if you, if this ice, if I paddle out here twice as far away from the radar, the strength of the signal coming back is going to be a 
quarter times quarter, which is a sixteenth. So if I'm twice as far away, the signal is 16 times weaker. So you can see very quickly as you paddle away, the, the return signal gets much, much weaker. So this is why I developed HDR radar. I built the world's first HDR sensing system, HDR radar, because the dynamic range is astronomical when you're looking at my dynamic range radar and LIDAR and SONAR. By the way, RADAR stands for radio direction and ranging, light direction and ranging, and this is sound location. So this, this uh, three things, these three concepts all play similarly and they all have the same dynamic range property. They fall off massively, so the HDR system really makes a lot of sense. It's almost necessary. So we're going to have some fun sensing, measuring Doppler returns from ice. So anyway, I hope that that just gives you an overview or a, a, a general, um, a, a, a general, uh, um, a general idea of what what it is that we're trying to do. And I want to inspire everybody to think about this. And your next lab is going to be fun. We're just going to have some fun. We're going to try and do something for the Water HCI, the Water Humans Computer Interface Initiative. And so on that happy note, um, I'd be happy to take any questions. And um, if there's anything that, that any of you want to touch on that you're wondering about, feel free to ask me. I'll open up my chat here just to uh, to see if anyone has any questions. Maybe just go wide open, I think, because it's in the dark down in this corner. Is it right? Okay. Jordana here. Hi. She's a SUP instructor, a stand-up paddleboard instructor. And she's going to join us for this fun uh, radar vision, uh, collecting some data, having some fun paddling on ice. I was just telling my class about radar vision and using radar to sense growlers and detect ice fragments and things like that. Very cool. Yeah. Ice, ice supping is fantastic. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. I'll let you finish up. So anyway, yeah, if you guys have any any questions or anything you want to follow up, uh, feel free to let me know. Lab uh, five, we're going to do some radar data. We're going to look at some radar data, Doppler returns from ice, and we're going to look at marine radar, and we're going to look at water HCI, water human computer interface. And hopefully some of you, if you do a really good job of lab five, we can roll that right into the conference. So your presentation day lines up exactly with the water HCI conference. So you're welcome to be part of the conference if you want to do something do something fun and do something well. Okay. Everybody hear me okay?